So in MS, for instance, uh, this symptom occurs in almost everybody. And um, as it turns out, in other uh, neurologic diseases, it's also very common, sometimes from si for similar reasons and sometimes for a bit uh, different reasons. So let's see then. Is everyone, is the temperature okay in here for everybody? Freezing. Freezing. Boy, I am the wrong person because I was thinking it was a little bit warm. You know, I think that's an age-related change that might be sexually linked. I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> There, I'll just digress a moment, and this is kind of, I always tend to bring up my children or my husband. My husband usually is the, the, the brunt of things that I talk about, but this one has to do with my son. So one day driving to soccer practice in, say, I think it was maybe April, beautiful day out in Maryland, 70 degrees, but it was the afternoon, so that sun was just beating down on the minivan windows, and I'm getting really hot. I mean, I'm flushed, getting that sweat down the back. I'm thinking, oh. Turn the air conditioning on. It doesn't matter that it's April. Turn that on. Turn it up full blast. Recirculate, and I am loving life. <sighs> now that's better. Meanwhile, my son has now put his legs up, and he's taken his soccer jersey over his legs, and he said, Mom, do, 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 do you think you can turn down the air conditioning? I can see my breath. <sighs> I was not happy. I said, fine, whatever. <laughs> Just to steal one of their words. But anyway, um, we'll try and get it right. But generally speaking, it's better if it's a little cooler because people become less fatigued. If we warm it up too much in here, I'm going to lose everybody. Usually this is a presentation that I give after lunch because then we can really talk about fatigue after you've had a nice meal and kind of sit there and like this. I don't take it personally, though. It's okay. So when we look at autoimmune diseases, there's lots of them. And um, we're not talking really about the peripheral nervous system uh, today, but is more in central nervous system, and particularly uh, these right here are the diseases that we're most interested in. So although this is a very, very common symptom, fatigue. Fatigue's common in everybody, right? So I traveled all day yesterday and got in at 9 o'clock, and of course, because I was getting sleepy on the plane and I had work to do, I had a cup of coffee, right? So I got here. There was not going to be any sleeping that went on because of that coffee. So finally around hmm, midnight, 1 o'clock, fell asleep. But my body is on East Coast time. I usually get up around 5 to 6. So I slept for about an hour and a half and then was wide awake and ready to go. So I think when I get on the plane this time, I'm going to have to be very, very careful that I don't start to drool. right? So fatigue affects everybody, but when you have a neurological disease such as MS, TM, and so forth, it becomes even more important because it's really starting to have a big effect on what you're able to do. It can be the single most disabling symptom. It can be the major reason why somebody has to stop working because they simply can't do the job. They don't have the stamina to keep up. Okay. Multiple etiologies are at play here. It can be from the primary diagnosis, it's believed. The actual inflammatory process may, might be playing a role. It can be secondary to that primary diagnosis. So that if your diagnosis produces spasticity or weakness or different types of symptoms, these symptoms may be impacting your energy level, thereby causing increased fatigue. And then there's a myriad of other potential causes because in fact, although if you have one of these neurological diseases, it should in fact, the laws of nature should be that that protects you from any other diagnosis that's out there. But unfortunately, we know it's not true. And as we get a little bit older, more and more other diagnoses are possible. So let's look for a minute about fatigue and MS because it's probably been studied best and in the, most, the highest number of people. And a lot of the things that relate to MS they relate to other uh, central nervous system diseases and fatigue. So as I mentioned, a huge number of people have fatigue related to multiple sclerosis. And of course, everything gets a definition. So a, a large council got together to say, okay, how are we going to decide what this is? It's very subjective, right? It's what you feel. Um, so it, it's perceived by the individual, and it impacts daily life. It impacts what you're able to do in your daily life. 
So it's believed that there's some immune system dysregulation, that, which of course is the basis for these immune system diseases, that's impacting energy. So it's contributing to this fatigue. There's a lot more inflammatory response that we see. Is that impacting, perhaps? This demyelination, the axonal damage. We also know that fatigue is, is associated with an exacerbation. When people have a relapse of their neurological illness, one of the heralding symptoms sometimes is an increase in fatigue level, then followed by other types of symptomatology. There's nerve fiber fatigue. So that, in fact, if you have damage in the central nervous system, and you try and perform a particular activity, walking, thinking, uh, moving your arm, whatever it happens to be, your stamina level, because that nerve fiber just doesn't have what it used to have, so your stamina level goes down, and your fatigue level then goes up. You're not able to last as long. It's, this is kind of, if you were able to walk two miles, you can walk a mile. If you were able to walk a block, now you can walk less than that and so that you can't do as much because things just wear out. Some people notice that they have fatigue set in, and they stop and they rest, and they get regenerated. It's like recharging the batteries, right? And so you're able then to go and do a little bit more, usually not quite as much as you were able to do the first go around, so that you fatigue sets in, you rest, you get up and go again, but not quite as far as you could that first time. It kind of diminishes each time. But there is a measure of recovery and recharging that does take place. So I just want to throw in a case study here, because we're going to talk about this as we go through the presentation. This uh, woman, 44-year-old, calls and reports fatigue. She's had MS for a while. She's tried to ignore this fatigue, but it's really impacting her daily life. She's a very busy woman. She works full time. She's married, she has two young children, she's on the PTA, she's a soccer mom, you know, kind of very busy life. At the end of the day, she's done. She is completely out of energy. She's not able to do anything after work but recover so that she's able to go to work the next day. On the weekends, she has to rest up in order to go to work on Monday. So everything in her life is revolving around this fatigue level. She's had MS for a while, her medications haven't really changed. The only thing that's changed is she's gotten older, okay? And 44, as far as I'm concerned, that's really just out of the cradle. So, um, and the <laughs> fatigue started three months prior, and it's getting worse. Now, the interesting thing is, when she called, she burst into tears. Now, you know, fatigue is a bad symptom. But generally speaking, it does not cause people to be hysterical. They're upset, but they're not. And so it was curious to me that it was this upsetting to her. So, other than the hysteria, does any of this fatigue sound familiar? In that you just run out of gas, and then you have to compromise all your other activities in order to recover to do the essentials. Okay. okay. Back to MS. MS fatigue is actually unique in that it comes on abruptly. It's not related to necessarily to activity, although that can be part of the overall fatigue picture often occurs at the same time. People hit a wall. That's it. I'm not doing any more. It's not that they want to sleep, or they may want to sleep, but it doesn't really help in their recovery. It's more they can't go on. I'm done. I cannot make my arm move another inch. That's it. It can be worsened by heat, which is not uncommon in any neurological disease. That when you add heat to a damaged system, it often can provoke fatigue. I like to liken it to Superman and kryptonite. Superman gets exposed to kryptonite, and he collapses. It's very similar with people with these neurological diseases that are exposed to heat and become very weak. So it prevents normal functioning, normal activities of daily living, and it's often described as a lassitude. What else causes fatigue? Changes in activity, sleep disturbance, and if you can't read that, the woman is saying, I'm sorry for being so cranky, I underslept again. So that's me. They, I best not have any delays at the airport because I've underslept. So depression, spasticity, medications, and then let's talk about each one of these just a little bit. So activity. There's activity and there's overactivity and being perhaps like this poor woman, a little overworked. There are good days and bad days. 
Does anyone experience good days and bad days? So that on the good days, you often utilize that time to get everything done that you can't do on the bad days. What that will lead to is more bad days. It's not creating damage necessarily, but what it's creating is an energy deficit that has to be repaid. Okay. So we can only do so much. And that's important for people to realize and that there is a certain amount of energy management that's going to take place when we look at these types of fatigue. Sleep disturbance, lots of reasons. And this goes across all of these neurological illnesses, spasms, pain, bladder dysfunction. How many times is someone getting up during the night to use the bathroom? How difficult is it to get from point A to point B? How much pain are you having that's preventing you from either falling asleep or staying asleep? Depression, sleep apnea, again, another diagnosis that may in fact be present. Narcolepsy during the day is certainly possible. Mood disorder. We know that there can be a reactive depression to having a diagnosis. We also know that there can be a depression associated with the diagnosis. Anxiety, stress, many things can be happening in someone's life related to their disease process. Is it affecting their family relationships? Is it affecting their job? These are all stressors that may have an impact on sleep, causing difficulty falling asleep, difficulty staying asleep, all that are going to impact daytime energy level, daytime fatigue levels. Spasticity, a huge part of diseases of the central nervous system, making mobility very difficult and very fatiguing. The amount of energy that it takes someone with spasticity to go from point A to point P, B is much greater if you have a lot of spasticity. It's a struggle to make those movements. And it can cause pain. Spasticity causes a lot of tension on the joints and the muscles and can be very painful. And when is it often worse? At night, when someone tries to sleep, they become more spastic. Makes it very difficult to stay asleep. Medications. Oftentimes, I often feel, if you've got a symptom, I've got a drug. But in doing that, many people get themselves on a polypharmacy, too many drugs. They can open up a Rite Aid out of their garage, or out here maybe it's CVS or Walgreens, I'm not sure. But the, the medications that we give for one symptom may impact another sy symptom, and often that's fatigue. Pain medications that we use, certainly narcotic, narcotics, but we also use anti-seizure drugs. We use gabapentin, we use Lyrica, we use Tegretol, Dilantin. These drugs can all have a measure of fatiguing qualities about them. Antispasticity drugs, baclofen, tizanidine, clonopin. I have many patients that call their clonopin clunkopin because clunk, they're out, okay? Different kind of fatigue than some of that muscle fiber fatigue that I talked about but still, it adds to the whole picture of general fatigue. Some of the antihypertensives that people are on, beta blockers, for instance, can be very fatiguing. Interferons that are utilized in MS. When your temperature goes up after an interferon, it can, be, it can cause a tremendous amount of fatigue symptom. Chemotherapy, when your counts drop, you can feel very, very fatigued. Deconditioning, is that a visual or what? Whew. Anyway, the less you do, the less you're able to do. It's vicious, vicious, vicious. So you say, Whew, I'm so tired, I can't work out. I just, I can't do it. I'm so tired, I'm not going to go to John's baseball game or soccer game. I can't walk that far. So you don't. So the less you do, the less you can do. The more you sit, the more lax your muscles become so that you have your fatigue that's part of the disease process now compromised and compounded by your inability to participate in any type of activity to maintain muscle strength and muscle stamina. Also, when there's inactivity and deconditioning, some of the symptoms associated with the disease will worsen, such as spasticity, for instance. When we see people with multiple sclerosis, we often see people that have difficulty pulling their leg up like this, okay? So they sit more. What happens then is they stretch out their gluteal muscles. So then when they go to stand up and walk, the whole apparatus that's necessary for walking is now weakened. So they can't go as far. They fatigue much quicker. 
other illnesses. Again, your neurological disease does not prevent you or protect you from other illnesses. And some of these other illnesses can be fatiguing in their own right, as you can see here. Hypothyroidism, anemia, um, very, very common to be associated, not associated with, but also seen as a comorbidity with your uh, neurological disease. Poor nutrition, um, the junk food diet that many of us get to be on because of our busy lifestyles, or because it's difficult to cook. So if it's difficult to cook, you have a lot of packaged things that you're using, and they're also not as good for you, may produce some fatigue. Infections, restless legs, which, by the way, is, is that person right there, in case you wondered what in the world she was doing. Okay. So just we have normal fatigue, and then we have fatigue associated with our illness superimposed from lots of reasons. The primary disease process, other diagnoses that may be present or may uh, develop, sleep disorders, deconditioning, pain, and so forth, and your psychological health. All of these are impacting your energy and fatigue. So what do we do to manage? The first thing is to assess. What's going on? What things can we modify? Uh, what things are potentially th that we can change to improve energy level? We want to manage the energy that someone has. If I start the day off, although not today necessarily, but if I start the day off with a cup of energy, perhaps someone with MS or TM or NMO starts the day off with a half a cup. If we both try and use the same amount of energy, I may drain mine down but the person that only started with a half a cup may be borrowing from the next day. So there, eventually it's going to catch up. Medications, can we, monitor, can we uh, alter these, modify the dosages, make them uh, at better times of the day so they don't impact energy as much? Aerobic exercise, can we utilize that to help in managing fatigue? Heat is the enemy of people, particularly with MS. Cooling therapy might be useful in managing energy level. Like a lot of things, though, it's never going to be one thing that's going to manage this symptom. And as I'm sure you'll hear throughout the day, it's rarely something that's going to manage, one thing is going to rarely manage any of the symptoms. It's going to be a combination of interventions to best manage the symptom. And it's going to require multiple disciplines being involved in many cases. Rehabilitation strategies. If I say to someone with fatigue, I really think that you should exercise more, the person thinks, looks at me like I have six heads. Did I not just tell you that I can't exercise because I'm too tired? But in fact, as counterintuitive as that may seem, when someone can exercise on a regular basis and increase the amount of exercise that they can have, it actually has a positive effect on their overall energy level. Does this mean to go to the gym until you're so worn out you can't do anything? No, has nothing to do with that. It can be things that you incorporate into your daily life. It can be very short bursts of activity, maybe five minutes, two weeks later, 10 minutes, then maybe 15 minutes of any type of exercise, whether you're an ambulatory person or not. Assistive devices. Many people really prolong or put off the use of an assistive device. Who want, I mean, again, kind of like the injectable therapy, no one has waited all their life to walk with a cane or a walker or use a wheeled uh, assisted device. But in using that, when fatigue is an issue, it may in fact restore a tremendous amount of energy because it's not being wasted on the struggle to go from one point to another. It also can be utilized as a tool to improve muscle strength improve walking or gait, and reduce the amount of fatigue that someone has. The way we manage our energy becomes very important in treating fatigue. Organization of the home, the workplace, when you choose to do things, and what things you choose to do. Is it important on one day to do everything that you need to do, or should it be separated out? Or can you get help? And many people don't like to ask for that help, but it's important to utilize the resources that you have so that you can maximize your energy level. There are no drugs that have a specific indication for fatigue management. There have been no double-blind placebo-controlled trials that have been done. And hopefully they're done a little bit better than these two guys here in the lab. 
but um, we borrow from a lot of other illnesses when we're looking at fatigue management. So these are some of the drugs that we use, amantadine, modafinil, methylphenidate, pemaline. Um, we use some uh, antidepressant drugs sometimes. We find that a lot of these are useful, particularly when someone does have kind of sleepy fatigue. It does help to have a little bit more uh, cognitive energy, um, a little bit more, a little less in their uh, fatigue at the end of the day kind of thing, gets them through their work day. But they're not useful for all the fatigue that people experience. So we try them, but they're not always the answer. We have to look at the overall wellness of an individual when we're looking at fatigue. So this cartoon is about diet. And so the guy says, so I'm free to go? And the tribesman says, yes, the chief's on a low-fat diet, chubby. And that's when I decided that losing weight wasn't a great idea. So there's two messages here. The first message is good for the chief that he's on a low-fat diet. And the second message is, unless you have a cannibal that's interested in you, there's no reason not to try and uh, lose weight if you have gained some. Having said that, it's very difficult to do if you have compromised mobility to be able to just go and lose weight. It can be a struggle. Um, but in working with your provider, uh, developing an exercise plan, often some weight can be lost. Although there's not a specific diet for these illnesses, having a low-fat diet, maintaining a, a good weight is often very, very beneficial in energy level. Exercise, we, you know, regular exercise, I talked about starting with a very small amount and increasing can be very useful in reducing fatigue, reducing spasticity, improving mobility. Emotional health, many, many of our folks uh, suffer from some depression. Managing that can help manage fatigue levels as well. Preventive medicine, Look, making sure that you are, in fact, looking at the rest of you. You're not this neurological disease. You're a person that happens to have that diagnosis. It's important to look at the rest of your health. If you ignore your health, it will go away. So smoking, overeating, in fact, there's been a, there was a study published in Brain, I think from 2003, that smoking is actually bad for MS, that it actually can make MS, the progression of MS, worse. So all of these things must go to maximize energy. You must pay attention to the rest of you. Make sure that you have a primary care physician and that you are, in fact, going for regular checkups. Now, back to our case study. So what do we do with JB, our 44-year-old patient who is exhausted at the end of the day, and she's hysterical? Why is she hysterical? Well, she has a few other symptoms. But the reason she's hysterical is her mother had multiple sclerosis and sadly died from complications of immobility. But the last symptom that JB remembered as a little girl that she, in her mind, thought tipped the scales was her mom reporting that she was so tired. And that's what made her hysterical because she was convinced she was going down the same road as her mom. But when she said she had shortness of breath on stair climbing and she had a change in eating habits, and the change was that she said, I can't stop chewing ice. I thought, oh, this is such good news to me. Does anyone know why that was good news? That's a sign of anemia, iron deficiency anemia. So we ordered a few tests and called her the next day, and she had severe iron deficiency anemia. She was placed on iron replacement therapy, and she went back to her normal level of activity. So what's the message there? Since we were ta not talking about iron deficiency causing fatigue, the message is that all of us are more than that original diagnosis that we have. And it's important to look at the entire picture and look at what's wrong to understand how to manage it best. For some people, it will have absolutely nothing to do with their primary diagnosis. And it's important not to just write it off to that diagnosis, which often gets done in chronic illness. Fatigue is a likely part of living with a neurological disease. It can be managed with multiple strategies, but we all must take care of all of us, our physical health, our emotional health, even our spiritual health. And with that, I think I will finish. Thank you.